All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You know, um, Anders posted something on Facebook this week. And when I read it, I thought, you know what? That is an amazing thing to post because it gives you an insight into who who he is and how he how he grew up and how he's come to where he is now. And I thought, and then I think Melissa said something about possibly, you know, uh, having us all do that kind of thing. So we, because it'd be, well, for one thing, it'd be interesting how we got to where we are and uh, two, how we, you know, what our life was like and, and lets everybody, because we have people all over the world here and it lets everybody know um, a little bit more about who, you know, who we are or, or maybe even why we are how we are, or whatever. But I don't want to get into that too deep because I have lots of lots of skeletons in the closet. But not really. It's just a. I mean, I consider it that. I like I like to leave stuff there because it's painful. But uh, so anyway, what I thought we I would do today is I'm going to start. I'm going to start out, and I'm going to I'm going to just share my kind of my story. And then uh, we can go from there. And uh, I'd like to kind of go through around the horn through, you know, some maybe not just maybe not all the day, probably not all the day, but uh, and just kind of get some some little insights into who each one of us is and how we came to where we are right now. And uh, I know that we're all here through the connection of Paul Gray. And speaking of. We have a, a television spot set up, and initially, what we're going to do is we're going to be doing uh, a show called "Grace to All" with Paul Gray in memoriam, and that's what that's what we're how we're going to start start that show out. And so we're going to be playing some of his uh, teachings and and podcasts and different stuff all down through um and once in a while you know i may jump in there and and do something along the same line that's something but uh that's kind of that's kind of the thought for now originally we were going to do two spots and i uh, i kind of came to the conclusion that right now i don't i don't have time to do that and so uh well, and I think uh, I was talking to Bob about this the other day, and I think that along the road they're going to have, and they have lots of slots, but uh, uh, all their overnight slots are filled. They filled really soon because they're the cheapest slot. But I, I told him, I said, you know, down the road, I, I'm sure there's going to be some attrition where, where people are going to realize that they can't keep up with this or they don't want to keep up with this or whatever. And so I'm. Uh, and so the slot that we have picked out is, uh, it's Eastern time and it's Wednesday at 5 p.m. is when we're going to be on Roku or when Paul's going to be on Roku. Uh, so whatever. And then uh, that those things are uh, on demand. So you can, you know, go to the show and, and pull it up for whatever time you want to. There will be on demand for six to eight weeks, they said. And so uh, kind of our plan is to make, to do these shows and they're, you know, 30 minute shows. And then we're, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is archive them onto our website so that they can be accessed through our website for anybody, anytime. And then uh, we're, we're working on our website, trying to make it more interactive and, and um, informative probably. So, so that's where we're at on that. So, there we go. We're all about me. Yay. No, <laughs> I, I don't like, I don't really like talking about myself a whole lot, but uh, I grew up, I grew up in <clears throat> South Central Kansas on a, a fairly large farm uh, that we never owned. Uh, my dad was afraid to buy property. And so he, uh, we leased, we had a deal with a, 
a farm a farmstead that was in a trust account, a family trust, and we my dad leased it for until he decided not to anymore. And he think he leased it when he was like nineteen years old, and then had it until um, he was in his it was in his late fifties when he decided to give it up, and then. Uh, but uh, so we grew up there and we had a lot of farm ground and we had a lot of beef cattle and we had dairy cattle and it was it was a real farm we had everything hogs and chickens and the whole nine yards so we we grew up doing big chores <laughs> you know the fact is my uh, one of my younger brothers said yeah, i think dad just had us so we'd have somebody to do, do all the work around the farm i'm like come on that's not right but uh Anyway, uh, my we worked hard. My dad was a fair man. He was uh, had a lot of expectations for us. He didn't did not like athletics, which was a sore spot for him, because my older brother and I were both well, all all of my all of my all four of my brothers, three of my brothers, and I were all into athletics and did you know were athletes, and, and I. You know, he told me he didn't like athletics one time. And I said, well, you know, it's your fault that we are athletes because, you know, it's the way, it's the way, way you're, the way you're built, you know, and he's a, he was, he was an, he was a natural athlete in high school, but he didn't, didn't participate because he had too much work to do at home. And he, he started farming when he was 15. And so, uh, so he would come home and do and work from school. So. He didn't ever get into the extracurricular activities, but during physical, you know, during their phys ed time and stuff in school, I guess he was, uh, and I, I got to meet one of his old phys ed coach teachers, the coach one time. And he said, he spent the whole time that my dad was in high school trying to talk him into going out for football and whatever, you know, a track, whatever, because my dad was very fast and, uh, but he was, uh, and quick, he had really quick reflexes. And he was, you know, he was a, he was a very strong individual. And so we, uh, that's how we grew up working, working on a farm. And then, uh, then I ended up getting a, a scholarship to Kansas State University to play football and uh, played three games and blew a knee. And that was the end of that. And so I, uh, after healing up from that, I uh, went in the military, joined joined the Air Force. And back then, it was at the at the end, toward the end of Vietnam. There was, I mean, there were still still had the draft and all that kind of stuff. But I was exempt from the draft because I was in college, right? But uh, once I dropped college, I went I went and enlisted because I didn't want to. A, I didn't want to be in the Army or the Marines. I wanted to be in the Air Force. And so at that time, I tell people they they would uh, basically they'd hold a mirror under your nose. If you fogged it up, you're in. You know, they did. that was the physical. <laughs> and so uh, otherwise, they would have given me a hard time. And they, they had uh, – I did have I did have this major scar down my knee, you know, where they'd open it up and did some work. But also between the time I – hurt my knee and then healed up and the time I went to the, to have my physical I was a buddy of mine and I were out riding dirt bikes and I dumped the dirt bike on a gravel road and ripped that scar open so it was really jagged and nasty and so so when they asked me about the scar I just said well you know I dumped a dirt bike on a gravel road and kind of they're like oh yeah okay that was all it was said so so anyway I went in and uh, my intention was to go in and serve 20, 20 years or so and retire and be done. And uh, lo and behold, I got, well, after when I was in basic training, I got, uh, when I got our, our orders to leave basic training, I, my orders were to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And my drill instructor pulled me aside and said, okay, I have to know who you know. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you have to know somebody because you 
nobody leaves here and goes there. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know anybody and I don't know what you're talking about. I said, why is that? He said, well, because that's a five-year controlled tour. Once you're there, you're there five years. I was like, that's, that's sweet. I like that. You know, I like Colorado Springs. And so I got out there and I was, I was out there for about a month and I was a, my official duty title was I was a, a civil engineer, a heavy equipment operator to construction. And so uh, I worked, I worked at the dump, the landfill at the Air Force Academy, right? I got called in. So I was out away from the base and everything else, kind of. I got called into the first sergeant's office and I was like, my first reaction was, crap, what did I do? (laughs) You know, I had to have done something to be called in, right? And so I got in the, the first sergeant's office and he handed me an order packet. And I was like, hold on. I thought, he goes, and he looked at me and kind of shook his head. He said, just open the thing. Well, my order packet was that I had been selected for special forces. Well, the Air Force technically doesn't have a job title for special forces. So basically, you do, you you are, you keep your same job title, but it's kind of a clandestine duty. And, our, and, especially, and they're tied to uh, equipment tied to a, what the Red Horse, which is like the Navy Seabees, it's a construction battalion. And they're kind of tied, kind of loosely tied to those. And because when the Red Horse goes in, their special forces goes in first and clears the area and makes sure it's safe. When Navy goes in, the Marines go in first. But they, the Air Force doesn't have that luxury, so they clandestine their own group. And they, we were based out of the of Eglin, Eglin Air Base in Florida. And they, uh, and we basically, I went down there a couple of times, uh, temporary duty for training. And then we wore, this was back in the early seventies, early to mid seventies. And we wore pagers. Nobody even knew what a pager was, you know, but we had these pagers that we had to wear and our guys were from all over the, all over the United States. And if we didn't have to answer if, you know, when the, f- the phone number would just come up on a pager and they were like, you, you don't have to call back. You just have to be on an airplane in an hour, pa- bags packed, headed to Florida. You know, so when we, when we got a call, we never knew where we were going until we got to Florida. Sometimes we didn't know until we were in the air leaving Florida. And uh, so I went through all that uh, crazy training. And I can tell you that special forces training is a brainwashing technique. Uh, and they basically train you to be a, a um, almost like a mercenary. You know, you're a you're trained you're a train killer. That's all there is to it, which was very very hard for me. Uh, although at the time, you know, it was a, it was I was 19 years old and it's an adrenaline rush to be, you know, that way, be that kind of that guy. And so we did a lot of and jumped out of jumped out of a lot of airplanes, which was a uh, crazy and then i did a uh, to kind of shorten the story up my 128th jump i i wore a, a knee brace all the time because they found out that my knee was jacked up and my 128th jump i hit a downdraft uh slam me into the ground and my knee brace broke and i would have been better off not wearing the knee brace that day because it made my knee go the opposite direction it was supposed to go. And uh, so, and from then on, I was pretty much uh, on convalescent leave and light duty for the next two years, off and on. And, uh, and then after, after the third, the third time I was on convalescent duty, they were like, you know what, we're just going to send you home to heal up. We're, you know, we're, you're done. And I really wanted to be cross-trained into something because I wanted to stay in. And at the time, they were trying to get rid of as many people they could. So they they wouldn't even let me cross-train. So I was out. And uh, so I have I am I am officially a disabled vet. And then, uh, but coming home from there, I mean, we went through a lot of crazy stuff. 
Um, the fact is, in when the first place we went on a, a mission was to Vietnam, and we went over there to move equipment and stuff. And uh, one of our one of the guys in my and I was I was twenty years old and I was the I was an E three and I was the head of our group at the time, which is crazy. But one of the guys in our group and our crew was standing with me on the over by the dock and uh, by the time we were over in Vietnam they had already signed the treaty so basically the war was technically over well the problem with Vietnam is it's all jungle and so when you're you know your politicians and and powers that be may sign a treaty but the guys out there in the jungle never hear about it and so we were in there and you know, moving some equipment around and stuff like that. And one of the guys that was standing next to me on the dock was shot and killed by a sniper. And so uh, we kind of took care of that situation, and, which I won't go into. But, uh, and then, uh, and just stuff, it's just, the stuff is all trauma. And uh, even before I went in the service, I was in my, some of my buddies and I were right before I went in the service, actually, not, you know, within a month when I went in, uh, my buddies and I were at a party on the, out in the middle of boonies somewhere. And uh, my, my, one of my, one of my best friends and I had gone to town to get food and more drinks and whatever, you know. And on the way back, he, uh, we were driving down a gravel road and he, a kind of an unknown type gravel road, something we had traveled a lot. And he came up on a railroad tracks that was humped way up in the, and he went over that, lost control of the car and side slid into a, uh, an oak tree about four feet across and was, he was killed instantly. And so that was a traumatic event thing. And so, and then after I got out of the military, I didn't realize how those effect those things affected me. Um, for lack of a better term, when I got home, I was absolutely, and I was married and had two little boys by this time. But when I got home, got out of the military, I was absolutely hell on wheels. I was, I was not not necessarily a good guy. I, uh, I had, uh, I worked construction because that's what I knew. Um, I'd work during the day and get off and go to the bar and, and be at, and my, you know, we'd be at the bar till midnight every night and I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and go back to work. So my wife already ever saw me except on weekends. And then, uh, I don't know, just, and most of the time when I got in, was in the bar, probably at least once or twice a week. I would get into a bar fight and luckily for me, the guy that owned the bar was a really, really good friend of mine and he would chase me out the back door and uh, he'd always tell me to park in the back and then he'd chase me out the back door after a, after a bar fight before the cops got there. So I wouldn't get in trouble. And then, uh, and then I kind of finally started to settle down a little bit and in that, in that settling down process, I felt like I was okay. And, uh, and we, you know, we raised, we had, you know, we had our family and moved around a little bit and had, uh, ended up my, my first wife and I had five children. We had four boys and a girl. And, uh, and after 18 years, she decided she didn't want to be married anymore. And I'm not, I don't want to go into the details there much, but, uh, she was from New England to start with. And so I think she really just wanted to go back home. And we were living in Kansas. Uh, so after the kids were pretty much raised, she moved back to New England with uh, our youngest son. And that was the only one that went with her. And then uh, after after he turned 18, he came back to Kansas too. And then, and now he's in Arizona, but regardless. So I thought I was okay. People would ask me, you know, they'd, They'd hear a little bit about my story, and they'd like, well, I, 
how do you do that? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I'm fine, you know, I'm fine. Well, it's probably eight or nine years ago, I guess. We had Andre Rabe, which we've had on our call here at our church. And uh, I have no idea what he said. No idea what it was. Whatever. But something he said triggered something in me. And I got up and walked out. And uh, my wife thought, my current wife thought, you know, I probably had to go to the bathroom or something, but then I didn't come back. And so she came out and I was sitting out in the hall uh, with the tears running down my face. And she said, are you okay? And I said, no, I am not okay. And at that time, I realized that I really did have some underlying PTSD. And uh, so I did go through some uh, counseling through the VA. And, uh, but the best counseling I had was with my brother, Paul Gray. He, uh, I mean, I was, at, even at that time, I was uh, a praise and worship pastor at the church, you know, and assistant pastor. And he, uh, but he, and he and I would meet at least once a week and spend an hour or so at coffee. Uh, we tried to keep it to an hour because he's scheduled, he kept, he kept, he was pretty scheduled, you know, he'd schedule everything. And so uh, that's how we would try and keep it. But I, I got more, um, healing through my visits with Paul Gray. And we would just talk about anything, everything, you know, and, and sometimes he would say, uh, he'd say things like, well, tell me about what you did, you know? And I'm like, nah, if I tell you, Paul, I have to kill you. You know, of course we laugh. And then, and so, but he did, I mean, I, he knew a lot more than anybody ever has. Um, uh, I don't, I don't talk about it. I don't talk about it to my wife. I don't talk about it to anybody really. Um, and, just a little while after that, my they had a documentary on TV about Vietnam. And uh, my wife said, I'd really like to record that and watch that. And I said, well, I can record it to you, but I can tell you right now, I'm not watching that. That's just not, that's just not going to happen. Because I think that would mess me up. And so I didn't. And, uh, and she didn't either matter of fact so uh, but I through the through all that I mean I even I guess probably what got me on the road to thinking I was okay was we got involved with a independent Baptist church and my dad had my dad and mom got uh, quote saved when I was 15 and so it was a huge change in our in our household and then a couple of years later my dad felt like he was called to preach and so he started uh he started a church started a church. actually what happened was a guy a neighbor far a neighbor farmer bought a church building on an on auction block because the organization that owned it didn't want it didn't want to keep upkeep and anything on it anymore so it was an old country church and it had originally been on property that this guy's family had donated to the church and they put this church up and had five acres and it was on a water well and everything you know um and so you know, charles bought this thing and then he came to my dad and asked him if he was if he would uh, start a church there and so they did my dad dad and mom started the church there and they were there until um i don't know they were probably there 40 years or better a little over 40 years and then uh, and when and the congregation a lot of congregation were local people um it was fun to watch them come to the knowledge of christ in them uh, my dad didn't preach that way. My dad was a hellfire uh, 
hellfire Baptist type preacher, you know, and, and whatever, you know. And so, uh, but I will have to say that God used him uh, to enlighten a lot of people. And so it was, uh, it was pretty cool to see him. To look back and see that, I guess. I didn't think it was so cool at the time when I was a teenager. But, uh, and then when I was in the military, of course, I was gone. And uh, then when I came back, uh, we ended up, my dad, my dad knew some people and I said something about wanting to be on a farm. And so he knew some people that had a ranch that they wanted to lease. And so he helped me lease this 2,800 acre ranch and we ran um, yearling steers on it for three years. And, and at the same time, you know, when you do that kind of thing, you only get paid once a year. So I just had to do something else too. So I went back into construction. And during that three years, I ended up starting my own construction company. And uh, at the end of three years, I just had to decide, we, we got really busy. I had to decide whether I wanted to raise cattle or run a construction crew and I chose the construction company because the cattle was pretty up and down market so anyway so let's see that's uh, so that's where I was but anyway we got involved with a an independent Baptist church and uh, we're there for a while and then we ended up moving to another uh, we, we were down by Wichita where we were originally Wichita Kansas and then we ended up moving like two hours northeast to another little town, a college town, because my wife wanted to go to school there. And I didn't want her driving back and forth, so I opted to drive back and forth rather than her. And then uh, was, and we went to another independent Baptist church there. And then we were there for oh, a couple, three years or something like that. And I was elected uh, deacon head had on the deacon board and they had a school a christian school so i was on the school board and all that kind of stuff and then but i i was a businessman around town and so i knew a lot of people well there was a group that came into town called strike force i don't know whether any of you are familiar or not but they're like these the power force guys you know they come in and things of strength and then they preach to but they go to they go to schools they do um, and so while they were here, I kind of got hooked up with them and traveled to the schools with them, helped them move, you know, set up stuff and things like that. And in fact, that one, I'm still really good friends with Keith Kraft, who was the head of Strike Force. And at one point in time, Keith was like, you should just go with us. And I'm like, I can't do that. You know, he said, you could do the stuff we do. I'm like, I, I don't want to for one thing. But uh, we got to be real close to him, and they were more of an assembly. He, well, he was, was uh, went to school in Assembly of God College. So it was a little different than, a, than an independent Baptist, of course. And so that was my first um, look at something besides fire and brimstone Baptist preaching, you know. And so uh, through that, then a little bit later, they had a crusade in at case at k-state in manhattan which was about an hour and a half from where i lived in for you and a bunch of the churches evangelical churches in the area were going to charter buses and take them to and take loads of buses to this crusade and so uh, it was it was not unlike a billy graham crusade it was just only it was louise palau who uh, you know and but anyway, they, uh, my pastor found out that I was wanting to get involved with this, and he called me aside. He said, that you, can't, you can't do that. And I'm like, can't do what? He said, well, we don't, we don't believe the same way. You can't, you can't be involved in that. I said, okay, let me, let me explain something to you. Yes, you are my pastor. You are not my God, and you will not tell me what I can and cannot do. And so I did it regardless. 
and he, uh, and so the, the pastor and the assistant pastor were both really upset, you know. And so he asked me when we got back, and when I got done with this, you know, a week or so later, he called me into his office, and I, of course, I went in, you know, and he said, "So, did, how has that affected your beliefs?" I said, "Well, I'll tell you what's affected is affected the fact that." This us for no more stuff doesn't work for me anymore. I'm not gonna, you know, we're not the only ones that have that have the truth, and I you can't tell me that anymore because I don't I don't buy it. And so, uh, so he asked me if he said, well, it might be better if you just would go someplace else. So I'm like, great. And so we um, we resigned, and my kid said kind of quit going there already because they had friends that went to charismatic churches and things like that. And they wanted to go with them because it was more fun, you know? Well, heck yeah. And so, so we ended up and my wife was friends with some people that went to a Southern Baptist church, but the Southern Baptist church had an evangelical free pastor. And so, and he was, and so we went there and really liked them. They had a youth, uh, their youth, directors were great and my two oldest boys um well my kids ended up switching to go there and because they liked it and it was fun and phil and sharon were great with the kids and then because a lot of the older people in the church were staunch southern baptists they ended up asking these pa the pastor and the youth pastor to resign because they wanted to go back to a more southern baptist look and, and it really, really upset my children. And that was when they really went someplace else totally. And then, and I, I said, I, you know what, if that's the way they're going to they're gonna play this game, I'm, I'm not going to do this either because I don't like this. It doesn't make sense to me. And so we ended up leaving and we started going to an assembly of God church, probably from the influence of Keith Kraft, I'm sure. And then, uh, and my, my, three oldest kids went to a, a charismatic church with a youth. They had a youth group that was just phenomenal. And so I couldn't hardly say no. And then, uh, and so I, I've had this evolution of, you know, all the way through. Um, and then we moved to, uh, then my, my first wife left. And then uh, a couple years later, uh, Devel and I got married. And she had three boys. And the first time I, and they were raised Nazarene. So the first time I took them to the Assembly of God Church, the boys sat there, they sat there like this. Like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> you know, and so uh, went to the went to Assembly Church and they were just like, uh, what are these people doing? <laughs> you know, it was totally foreign to them. And then, uh, and, my, and Devel would look at them and pat, their, pat them and say, just they're just making a joyful noise. Just think of it like that. <laughs> and so, so anyway, then uh, we ended up moving to halfway between Emporia and Lawrence, where we live now, and uh, bought a dinner theater, which was a whole lot of fun. That's a little uh, tongue in cheek there. It was a lot of fun. It was real expensive to run that, <laughs> but because it was in an old barn, it was a really cool place. And so we uh, we ran that for a few years, and we ended up in a, sm in a small community. And when we moved there, we knew nobody. When we left there eight years later, we knew everybody because everybody had either been to our place or heard about our place and knew who we were. And so we had contact with everybody. But we ended up in a small Assembly of God church in uh, in Linden, Kansas, and uh, not probably six months or so after we started going there, we we ended up joining because that's what church you know churches want you to join their thing, which I'm thankful that we're not like that. And then uh, they uh, the the pastor ended up leaving, and they and I was on they I've been elected to the deacon board blah blah blah. so they they made me the head of the pastoral search committee also well there was about 
30 people in this church and they wanted to hire a pastor that had 30 years experience, you know, what, and I'm like, I, I can tell you right now, that's not going to happen because you can't afford one like that. You know, these guys, they're not leaving a church to go, go down. They're leaving a church to go to a bigger church. Probably. And so that they asked me if I would be interim pastor while we were searching for a pastor. And I was like, uh, and I said, well, let me pray about it. And God immediately told me, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And so in that, in that time I grew spiritually, I grew a lot. Um, and I was leading this congregation as an assembly of God pastor, actually. And then, uh, after about I was a little over a year, I guess, we searched for a pastor in this net. And they would say, we do not want, we're not hiring a youth pastor. We're just not going to hire a youth pastor to take over the church as a senior pastor. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but I think that's what you're going to get. And so, and in the meantime, God had been speaking to me about us leaving. And whenever, and I, he'd wake, it seemed like invariably he would wake me up at three o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. You know, and so I would get up and talk to him for a while and go over my stuff for that Sunday morning and this and that. And he would, I would, I would literally hear him say, it's time for you to leave. And I would say, as soon as we find a pastor, that was my, that was my rebuttal. As soon as we find a pastor. And this went on for two or three months, you know, and every, you know, every week or two, I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning. It's time for you to leave. Well, as soon as we find a pastor. And so after enough time, finally, he woke me up one Sunday morning and said, again, it's time for you to leave. And I started to say, as soon as, and it was like, he cut me off and said, no, now. And we've, we'd had some turmoil in the church because some of the people didn't think I was serious about looking for a new pastor and blah, blah, blah. You know, it was an interesting church because there was a, a family unit, like brothers, sisters, mothers, dads, grandma, grandpas that were all, there's about 15 of them in this one family and they kind of ran the church. And so they were, you know, one of them was getting a little cross with me. And, and so we were supposed to have a update meeting that Sunday night. And so when Devel got up that, Sunday morning, I told her, I said, um, God told me we're supposed to leave the church. And she's like, what? And she was uh, teaching all, all the kids. So she had all the kids in Sunday school and children's church, basically. And so I told her, I said, I am not going to say anything this morning. I, uh, because we have this meeting scheduled for tonight, I'm just going to wait you know, and she was, and she was all teary eyed and everything. Uh, we were, I was still leading praise and worship and she was on the praise and worship team that morning. And she stood up there, tears running down her face, trying to sing and uh, realizing that, that we're, you know, we're going to be leaving. And so that night we went to the meeting and uh, right off the bat, this one guy started, started in on me. And I said, you know what, just hold on. I think I can fix this real quickly here. And I just slid my letter of resignation out in the middle of the table. And so uh, he picked it up and read it out loud. And it changed the whole dynamic of that meeting. I mean, it's totally. And uh, it, uh, and also I, I said, okay, so so now don't ask me questions. You need to be asking yourself because I'm out of this now. And within two weeks after we left, physically, we left two weeks later. And two weeks after we left, they hired a youth pastor <laughs> to uh, be the senior pastor of the church. And he was actually, he was absolutely wonderful. And then, of course, he he did he moved on because he was a young pastor and he wanted a bigger church too. So, and, and he ended up going back to his hometown, which is was fine here and there. And so then we uh, we moved to Lawrence because my wife ended up with a job at KU uh, in food service for a sorority house. 
And so we moved to Lawrence and we were sh church shopping all over the, I mean, we'd been to almost every church in town. And literally one Sunday morning, I was, I said to her, I said, so where, where do you want to go to church today? And she goes, I have no idea. So I just picked up the phone book. I started flipping through the phone book and I'm like, well, look at this. Here's a church here downtown. The pastor's name is Paul Gray. And she said, I know Paul Gray. She said, he used to have a nightclub here in town. And I'm like, what? She said, yeah, he used to have a nightclub here in town. And I said, that's where we're going. I'm in. And so we went, we went and they had a guest preacher. I'm not a guest preacher, but they, Paul did this group teaching type thing. And there were two or three other people that taught besides him. And so we went and this lady was teaching and it was great. It was good. Teaching was great and everything. And Paul met us at the door as we were leaving and said, uh, he said, well, you got to come back because I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a, didn't get a priest today. And so we we're like, okay, fine. So, so we, uh, the next week, next Sunday, we went back and one of the other guys was preaching and it was great. It was great. And so, he met us at the door again and said, okay, I'm definitely preaching next Sunday. So you got to come back. And he said, and if you come, don't come back after that, I'll know it's me. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. So we went back the next Sunday and uh, we, we just basically fell in love. And this was about the time that Paul had just started talking about grace because he, I mean, Paul, they were, they were pretty fundamental, you know, fundamental type, you know, a pretty fundamental type church, evangelical type church. And so he would just start talking about grace and it intrigued me. And so we ended up, you know, going back. And then at one point in time, I said something about joining the church and Paul said, oh, we don't do that here. And I'm like, Okay. You know, he said, just come. I'm like, okay, fine. And so then we get, then they used to have a medical clinic in the church, in the church building. And they uh, were still running that in the church building when we first went there. And, uh, and I was basically retired. I'd retired, sold my construction company and we retired. And so I would go down, they'd have medical clinics on, I think it was Wednesdays. And I would go down there on Wednesday and I would, pray with people coming into the clinic. I would, uh, and we had other people that would come in there. Carolyn uh, would used to come in there quite often. And Paul would have, during that day, he would also have a thing called brown bag, brown bag with Paul Gray or brown bag lunch with Paul Gray or something like that. You know, so we'd bring our own lunch and sit around the table in the sanctuary and, and talk during lunchtime. But uh, so to me, I, I mean, to me, we got pretty close during that time. And, and then, uh, as time went on, we got, I, I felt like Paul and I got closer and closer and as a church, as he, as we, I should say, as we, as we grew in grace, the church diminished in size. <laughs> and so, which I think is, seems to be fairly, uh, fairly much the way it goes. And so we got down to a point where um, he, he asked me at one point to become, to be the praise and worship pastor and associate pastor. And I'm like, yeah, and I was like, sure. I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm good game. I've done that before. I'll do it again. And so, and I want to follow what you're doing. And so we ended up uh, leading praise and worship basically up until the time that we uh, couldn't meet anymore during COVID. And even then we had some praise and worship nights that we would have uh, at the, we'd have get a big room at the restaurant we go to on Sunday nights and, and we'd have uh, praise and worship music and whatever, you know, it was, and, and we still, I still, we still want to do that. So uh, probably we've done some work on our house to, accommodate we had a super bowl party which was really fun by the way and uh then uh we got we built a deck on the back of the house so probably summertime we're probably going to do some 
get together stuff on late late afternoon, Sunday afternoons, and stuff like that. Have have music and and just uh, sit around and of course have music and food and just enjoy each other's company and in nature. So that's what, kind of what we're kind of future plan for that. And so as uh, as time went on, Paul. Well, and originally, I was a faith. I was in the the faith movement big time, and so I was a faith preacher, truthfully. And then, <clears throat> so when when I first when we first started going to the church, and Paul and I first started hanging out together, he said this to me one day. He said, "I think God brought you to this church to teach me about faith, and me to teach you about grace." I said, I I firmly believe that. I think you're right, right on. And so we played this, we played off each other and we both felt like we gained from each other's strengths and uh, taught each other a ton. And uh, it was just, it was just so, the best experience I've ever, you know, in my whole life. But he, he did, he was really instrumental in helping me walk through walk out of uh ptsd and things like that i just uh you know you didn't you know when you're in something like that you don't realize you have kind of hidden anger issues and uh and that's, to me that's kind of what ptsd is there's something has happened and whenever you think about it, it makes you angry enough to to you know do something irrational and uh, so he was uh, uh, he was a great friend and taught me to uh, to be able to walk, walk through that stuff. And uh, he walked through it with me a lot. And we would we would go to coffee and we would tell stories that I will never tell anybody else. Uh, because and both of us were that we just we told things that were just like. First, sometimes we'd say, "Yeah, I can't believe you told me that <laughs> type thing," but it was a, uh, it was fun, and uh, it was, it's, I think it's what made us really close too, and uh, we trusted each other wholeheartedly, and uh, loved each other wholeheartedly, you know. So, and I, uh, he's given me, he gave, I feel like that he's helped me understand the immenseness of God's love. And because of that, I can share that love with y'all and with everybody I come in contact with. And uh, it's just, I don't know. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, uh, and then his, his homecoming has advanced me to this position, which at first I was like, uh, <laughs> But you know, God is so good. He's so good. He uh, he always gives us just what we need when we need it. So I have uh, grown to trust Him more and more all the time. And when I have trouble trusting Him, I always say, "Paul, oh, what would you do?" <laughs> and amazingly enough, something He has said in the past will come to mind. So. It's a great thing. So, so there's me. So, hey JL, where did you meet Devel? Where? Yeah. We uh, well, I was a building contractor, and we lived in Emporia, which was a small college town. And she had gone to college there. She lived in Lawrence, but she grew up in Lawrence, but she'd gone to Emporia to school as a non-traditional student. So when she went to college there, she had three boys. And then she, when she, after she graduated from college, with which is really funny, she graduated with an art degree and went to work in a lumber yard. <laughs> and, and so uh, she was actually worked in the millwork department, which is windows and doors, and things like that. And I was, at the time, I was doing a bunch of historical renovation type stuff for the city. And I would go in there and order these off the wall 
uh, windows and doors and stuff with weird, weird setups and weird trims. So, so it would match. Lenny Sigmund said he understands what I'm saying. So, which, so it would match what was there already, you know. And the first time I did that, she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I said, well, where's your book? Let me show you. You know, and so we got her book out and I showed her how to do all this stuff, get it ordered and stuff like that. And a lot of that, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take credit for it because she was really good anyway. But she became the top millwork salesperson in the region for that company. And so, uh, and she would, she would always outsell everybody in the region and get a, you know, get a big bonus and all that kind of stuff. So which was kind of cool. And I, I felt like I helped her do that you know, sometimes. And, uh, and so then we, uh, and so that's how we met. And then I don't know, I said, one day I said something about, well, you know, what do you, what do you do for lunch? And she goes, I don't know. You know? And so I invited her to lunch a couple of days later and we actually just went to the park and had a picnic and I took, took everything, you know, and so it's kind of fun. And then, uh, it just kind of went from there. So does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Philip, what do you got? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about, I just had a question because I, I did military conscription in South Africa, but we didn't call it a draft. How, how does a draft work in the U.S. at the time? And do um, they still have it now? No, they don't. They used to send out uh, numbered notifications when you turned 18. Uh. And then they would have numbers this, through this and this would be called into uh, into into duty or whatever, you know what I mean? Something like that. So it was kind of an interesting thing. So Dana, okay. what do you got? Oh, I I wanted to just thank you for, for doing that, telling us uh, all about your life and how um, things progressed. And my goodness, you had a lot of experience uh, in church stuff as well as before that too with military and farming and my goodness what a background <laughs> and uh you know it really helps get a broader bigger picture of who jl is and that's uh, my point that's what i wanted to do yeah, it's really very very interesting and and good you know good to know and uh feel like we know you so much better and see you and as more of a whole person instead of just coming you All know right. as the leader of our group thank you yeah. so much no oh, you're welcome well now so now if i do if i say something really off the wall you'll just go oh that must be that ptsd stuff coming out <laughs> so who knows right so. nancy what do you got I just want to say it's confession time. I thank you for sharing. That was that was very insightful. Um, but it's confession time. I'm one of the people that attended the barn theater that you ran. The entertainment oh, was absolutely fabulous. The Vassar Playhouse. Yes, yes. I went several wow. times. Wow. But I remember that we had peanuts and we would eat the peanuts and throw the shells on the floor. And I often wondered when I left. The owner is going to be really ticked off at these people that do that. So one of them was me. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> it was that was the plan. It was just a okay, pain to, to clean all that stuff up. <laughs> that was my <laughs> job. <laughs> so yeah, that was it. Was fun times. We had we just have different groups come in, and uh, my wife would advertise the thing as a crazy quilt of entertainment, and we would have everything from plays to you know music shows branson style shows and bluegrass music just I, just everything and uh it was it was interesting how the crowds would differ for what we had coming in and we did get to a point where we did have bus tours that would come in um i think the fourth year we were there they did a uh 
the Ottawa, which is not in our county, but their um, tourism department or whatever you call it, um, they brought people in from all over the state of Kansas and they hauled it. They took them around to different venues and stuff. And our venue was voted best entertainment and best food in the state of Kansas. So I'm, and I can, uh, those of you who have never seen me, my whole thing, I'm a little overweight. And the reason is because my wife is a heck of a cook. <laughs> I blame, I blame her, but you know, I give her, also give her credit for keeping me going. So, yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. It should have never stopped. We enjoyed it a lot. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. I don't run across people too often when uh, that have that have been there. So, thank you for saying that, Joe. What do you got? How did you let go of your Baptist and evangelical beliefs? Was that a gradual process? Was it sudden? Was it painful? Was it hard? Tell us about it. It was well. You know, it was. It was kind of gradual because of the evolution of it. You know, I mean, I felt like, well, now looking back on it, I feel like God was pushing us out of it. And uh, at the time, you know, I, I was just, I was angry with them for trying to control me, you know. And so that was, it was fairly easy for me to walk away uh, from each step because I felt like it was controlling. The hardest one to walk away from was the little church in Linden because, and not because of the theology or anything else was just was mainly because of the, the camaraderie. The, it was a small church and it was like a big family. And so that was the hardest one to walk away from. And then, and then of course we walked into a, a church with a bigger family and, and extremely accepting people. And it's just been lovely. So it's, it's been kind of an evolution process. So I, I can't say as it was, hard to walk away it was hard to a little bit harder that to evolve you know to where the new stage was in our life so you know what i mean so lenny what do you got i was going to ask you a similar question to what joe just did uh kind of like i asked paul bergman a couple weeks ago is is there any one specific issue that led you down this path or to the path of deconstruction or was it the whole issue of moving from different churches or what Paul Gray taught you or a little bit of everything? I think most of my, well, I, first of all, I, I deconstructed from this straight line independent Baptist who think, you know, we're the only ones that know what, know how to get to where God is and blah, blah, blah which, you know, is total bullshit. But uh, anyway, so I was easy. It was easy for me to walk away from that once I realized, the, you know, the BS that was there. And, uh, and, and, you know, I guess I've learned just recently, actually, that uh, the theology, I, and I've, I've coined it, I've picked up a Paul, a Paul Young phrase, is that uh, it's, you know, they make you, they beat you down to where you feel like you have to grovel to be, to be accepted by God. You know what I mean? And so, and they use this theology, which Paul Gray and I now call, and not Paul Gray, but Paul Young and I now call piece of shit theology. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a piece of crap. You know, they make you feel like that. And so uh, that you have to be in with them to not feel like that, I guess. And so by the time, by the time I was leaving those churches, I was, and I, I don't have to say there are people in those churches still to this day that I dearly love. And I'm still friends with, we just don't talk about, we just don't talk about religion at all and, uh, or stuff like that. So it's just, and it, so each step was a step. And it was all, uh, all a step to, I mean, the higher thing, but the basic from, well, I went from the Southern Baptist thing, which was, like I said, was evangelical free, which was not really Southern Baptist teaching at all. It was very accepting and very uh, seeker 
you know, type thing. They were all about seekers. And then uh, I went from that to Assembly of God. And so um, I guess the transition there was huge to me uh, because I felt like God gave me some insight there. And then at that point, that was the point when I, I got into the word of faith more. And so, uh, which was not exactly to their liking either. So I, I, I was kind of on the outskirts of all those denominations whenever I was in, them, you know? And so then when, uh, when we came to uh, this church, just uh, most of my deconstruction from, uh, I guess from the original, you know, independent Baptist was, was along, along the way, but going from, uh, you have to feel like a piece of crap and repent, which I thought meant to, you know, grovel and beg and plead stuff, which is not true at all. Uh, most of that transition came through, through Paul. So Bobby, what you got brother? Latin, by the way, is uh, religio minus extra minister, so you'll know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 I know deconstruction is a popularly used phrase, but that's not what's happened to me. What's happened to me, and, and, and in my opinion, everybody on this call, is realization. And, and I want to emphasize the word real here. Yeah. Uh, we have gone from being taught things that were not real to, to discovering along our path because we're willing to continue to walk, by the way, we're not, we're not willing to stop anywhere. We, it would, I, I don't think anybody here will say that at some point or another it wouldn't have been more comfortable to stop, <laughs> but that spirit that made Moses say, I've, I've got to turn aside and see what this is. I, I must. I love that term. Here's a burning bush. The smart guy is just say, wow, there's a burning bush. I don't want to get sand, right? But the compelling spirit of the Lord was, I must, I've got to find out what's going on here. And, and, and that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is continually motivating us to see a bigger God. And, and so what is popularly called deconstruction implies that you're tearing down and going back. Whereas what you're really doing is, is, is seeing the bones. What, what Brian's on said, of the evangelical movement, he said, I'm packing my bags and leaving the evangelical movement. He said, the reason I'm packing my bags is there are things there of value that I want to take with me. Yeah. So it it's the next step on a path, and, and, and that day of what Moses saw the burning bush. By the way, he was days outside the camp. That wasn't the model. The model was you, you set up camp and you went out and back, and every day all day you couldn't find feed for the for the sheep, and then you moved the camp because it wasn't safe to two days away. But most of those guys were out there where it wasn't safe. And everybody here has done the same thing. Hey Bob, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off for a minute because it's uh, yeah it's hard to hear hard to hear you because your mic is cutting in and out really bad. <clears throat> so it's hard to understand what you're saying. Oh so wow. I don't know what's going on. It's just kind of it's just kind of cutting okay. in and out. So so um, I'm gonna have Dana go and then we can come back to you. Okay. Um, I was just gonna ask you about um. Because Andrew Womack, uh, I found out about him on just my sister, I think, told me. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was on TV. And he really was helpful in a lot yeah. of ways. So how did you link up with that? Well, <clears throat> I, uh, <laughs> I was uh, pretty quickly going into, I mean, I, I went to Kenneth Copeland's things. Uh, I became friends with Jerry Savelle, Jesse Duplantis, uh, and I went. I met Andrew Womack through Bobby Andian down in Tulsa, 
and I uh, became friends with him. And so, yeah, they, these guys were all real influential in my, um, my faith preaching era, you know, and even still today, because I, I just adapted it to the quantum because what they're preaching is not wrong, but they're, they're, they're going about, I think a little bit, a little bit askew. And so when you, when you tie it into quantum, then, then it becomes a reality. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I've, and, and I have watched some of these guys, Keith Moore and uh, Creflo Dollar and some of these guys really, really leaning towards hyper grace. And even Andrew at one time, according to Jamie Englehart, we had Jamie Englehart at our church here, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And I got the honor to, of buying his dinner and having him sit at our table. And uh, we, we talked about Andrew Womack. And he, he said he used to get invited to Karis to speak quite regularly by Andrew himself. Well, then when one of the board members sat in on one of his talks and told Andrew that he couldn't invite him anymore. And, and actually, Andrew, at that same time, about that same time, Andrew did a, a broadcast about grace and about all about inclusion and he in in 24 hour period of time he lost over a thousand backers and so his board said you can't teach that way anymore and so they told him and so he's so he's very careful uh, but he's he's really in the same in the same on the same page that we are. He just can't lay that out because it's because it's, it hurts his ministry as far as financial. And so, and you know, I mean, he raises millions and millions of dollars every year uh, for his ministry, and so the board didn't want him to jeopardize that the stuff that they have, you know, planned, things like that. So they told him that he couldn't, he couldn't teach like that anymore. And so he doesn't teach the, he basically just shies away from all inclusion. He has, he has a, a, a teaching and a, a book called the balance between grace and faith, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, the fact is I, Paul and I went through that book together, uh, when we were going through, you know, learning about what each other was teaching. So, but it's a, it's a great, it's a great, a great book. And so a great, a great lesson. Stan, what do you got? Okay. I was just going to pipe in about um, something that I can really relate to that you shared. You talked about going church shopping. Yeah. I can recall a period of my life during the same thing except some pastors called it church hopping. Yeah, and yeah. They didn't like it too much because, you know, the idea was you got to get plugged in somewhere and you got to right. bloom where you're planted and that sort of thing. But right. I was just going to say I could really relate to that. <laughs> well, you know, it's all it's all about the tithe. <laughs> That's why you got to get plugged in because you got to tithe there. So, yeah. And speaking of that, I appreciate everything that y'all do. So, thank you. So, Bob, are you fixed or not? I don't know. Let's see if I am. Uh, is it yep. better now? Yep, definitely. It's probably my headset. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what we got and didn't get, but what I was saying is that... Uh, The Holy Spirit's going to continually reveal yeah. more truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question yeah. becomes, are you willing to walk in it? Yeah. It's always going to be scary. It's always going to be outside the camp. Uh, Lord spoke to me last week and reminded me that every prophet anywhere in the Bible was a loner. 
they never fit in a group. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you talked about Paul Young earlier. Paul, I heard him on a, a podcast talking about a friend that wrote a book on hermeneutics and asked Paul to re review it. And Paul did. And the guy said, what did you think? And he said, well, it's well written, but you left the two most important factors out. And, and the guy said, what's that? And he said, uh, uh, job security and peer pressure. Mm. Uh, yeah. Getting outside the camp is going to cost you something. Yeah. And uh, uh, we it, 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 it's in the choice between money and industry happens and it invariably does the one of the greater the choice becomes it's sad when money wins yeah i know uh, but it does it does it does way too often i've seen it i've sat in pastors offices and watched them literally make that choice yeah uh, it's it, it's always it's always based on I've got to protect my body from what God, well, you know, from yeah. who you protect it from the Holy Spirit, you know, and so, yeah, it, it, anything worth anything is always going to cost something, yeah, and, uh, and 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 what what the the the, the pain you feel. Uh, from from having to separate from people you love, and by the way, in many cases, being disassociated by them, you know, driving by your house and your front, and you're in the front yard, they don't look up and wave, kind of stuff is uh, it, it, it's what it costs, but it's it's yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, it is. You know, I uh, I'm going to kind of jump back on something that Dana was talking about. Uh, you know, all these guys, Kenneth Copeland. Jesse Duplantis, Jerry Savelle, all these guys are leaning more and more towards grace. And I think it's because God said, I will pour out my spirit in the last days. And what that literally means in the original language is that, that it's the spirit of grace and mercy. And, and, to, and the, he also says in that passage that it's, it's to everyone. And so that makes it all inclusive. And they uh, they have to they have to tread because of where they are, which I think is very sad. They have to tread very lightly because people want, as a as a general rule, people want to be told what to do. You know, they don't want they don't want to be able to. Uh, or I guess they don't know how for most part, they're not taught, they're not taught how to listen to God. Instead, you listen to the pastor and he's going to tell you what to do. And they want to be, they want to be controlled somewhat. And so that's why these guys can't just totally get away from their old, their old teachings because the people don't like it. I mean, we, like we witnessed that. We witnessed that in, in our church, you know, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's just a sad thing to, to witness, actually. Melissa. Um, I just wanted to tack on to what you, I like the direction you guys took it. Uh, we, we need to remember that the, God is pouring his Holy Spirit out on everyone. Amen. And Amen. it's not, um, you know, I put in the chat that I like all of these terms better than deconstruction. Realization, awakening evolving, growing, becoming, becoming who we already are, and, and enlightenment. And we have to remember that it's, everybody's at different stages of enlightenment, and um, there is no us and them. There's no, somebody posted about that on Facebook, and it really spoke to me the, about all the evangelical bashing, and people specifically, sorry, say you, you know, they specifically bash evangelicals. And, you know, 
remember that it's about the theology. It's the theology you disagree with. Not, it's not about the people. Um, right, right. We're all at different stages. We're all on the same journey. And if we believe God, there's going to come a day when everyone gets it. Yeah. When every tongue confesses and every knee bows. And mm -hmm. so if we believe that, then we'll have patience and compassion with people. And, um, yeah. you know, not, make it, not make it, not label everyone. Well, you know, they're, a, they're, a, right. they're an evangelical, they're a Calvinist, they're a this, they're a that. You right. know, we're all just <laughs> children of God trying to figure it out and make our own way. Amen. Amen. Perfect. I love it. Kitsy. Melissa, that was amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Amen, amen, amen. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Okay, well, I uh, we've had a good good visit. And yeah. I uh, I hope you uh, I, hope, I hope I didn't bore you with my story. We loved hearing your story. <laughs> so uh, I am probably, I like this. I like this getting to know each other. So I'm probably going to reach out to somebody for maybe about, about telling your story next week. And uh, if you can, if you can think about it and give me an idea of how long it would be, maybe we can get a couple in if we, you know, for shorter, uh, you could, you're more than welcome to take the whole time if you want. Uh, and so don't be afraid. <laughs> God I wouldn't is, God bore is, you. God I is wouldn't bore that. you. Well, I say I wouldn't bore JL. I'm waiting for JL, the movie. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it did read like a movie script. <laughs> it, would be a, it would be a scary thing, Sam. <laughs> it could be a scary thing. Yeah. So, I love y'all, and I appreciate y'all very much. Love I you back. Appreciate your support, and you guys are you guys are just so awesome. Just uh, JL, you rock. Make my life, make my life, That's make my life That's better. Right. Yeah, make my life better. <laughs> love y'all, and we will see you all next week. All right. And uh, have a great, great, great week. Shalom, shalom. Love you. Shalom, shalom. Be blessed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.